So I'm going to talk about the unity of self-consciousness in split-brain patients. But before we begin, what is a split-brain patient? Well, everyone's brain contains the corpus callosum, which is a band of fibers connecting the two hemispheres. This allows the two hemispheres to communicate in the form of electrical activity. Now, in epileptic patients, the corpus callosum also allows seizures to pass from one hemisphere to another. So sometimes the corpus callosum is cut to restrict the seizure to one hemisphere. And this procedure is called a corpus callosum. Although a little extreme, it can be very effective when drugs are ineffective. So this cuts off most of the communication between the hemispheres. Some information is still passed, and they receive a lot of duplicate information from the brainstem. Um, so the brainstem initiates razzle, so both hemispheres fall asleep and wake up at the same time. Both hemispheres also receive the same proprioceptive information and perceive painful stimuli from both sides of the body. In fact, in many ways, split-brain patients don't behave any differently, and for a while, no abnormal behavior was detected. But later it was discovered that in controlled experiments, you could observe the effects of cutting the corpus callosum. So it's important to know that higher order sensory information is lateralized in split brain patients, including visual information. So the left hemisphere can perceive the right visual field and vice versa. Also, the projections from the body parts are controlled contralaterally, meaning the right hemisphere controls the left hand, the left hemisphere controls the right hand. And this normally wouldn't make a difference, but when the corpus callosum is severed, this higher order information and motor control information are not exchanged between the hemispheres. So what is known by one hemisphere is not known by the other. This means if you present information to only one hemisphere, the other hemisphere wouldn't know that information was presented at all. And so from experimentation on split brain patients, we've learned where functions are localized in the brain. Like a major distinction is that the left hemisphere contains language, while the right hemisphere is more about um, spatial imagery. But we can also learn a thing or two about consciousness, and more specifically, self-consciousness. It's interesting to note that even though the hemispheres are disconnected and they cannot communicate, the split-brain patient does not feel anything less than whole. So people have still questioned whether um, their consciousness is still unified. Um, and in my paper, I focus on self-consciousness and the possible states of self-awareness in the split-brain patient. Out of the possible theories of self-consciousness in the split-brain patient, I argue that both hemispheres are self-conscious, and they are both fully self-conscious. So I first argue that self-consciousness is split. I consider self-consciousness to be a higher form of consciousness. So if consciousness is considered to be divided in the split-brain patient, then self-consciousness must also be divided. I next argue that both hemispheres are fully self-aware. This means that they must be aware of the other hemisphere as distinct from itself. And there's a study that shows the right hemisphere is self-aware according to this definition. So in this study, the patient feels a pen in her left hand um, so that only her right hemisphere is aware of the object. She is not able to express what she feels in words because the right hemisphere has no language abilities. But the right hemisphere can express emotions. So while she says she doesn't know what she feels and lists off a couple of wrong answers, at the same time she is frowning and shaking her head. And this is the right hemisphere expressing its discontent and annoyance with the answers that the left hemisphere provides. An even better example um, is a patient who again could not identify a pencil in his left hand. So his left hand pressed his thumb down onto the point of the pencil and only then did he shout out, it's a pencil. This means the right hemisphere knew that the left hemisphere was not correctly identifying the object and that it could be cued by pain because it knew that both hemispheres experienced pain. So I argue that this shows the right hemisphere is, is fully self-conscious and aware of the other hemisphere as distinct from itself. So one philosopher in particular would argue against me. Elaine Morin argues that only the left hemisphere is fully aware while the right hemisphere has a more primitive form of self-consciousness. He says this is because only the left hemisphere is capable of language, and so he argues that uh, language is necessary for full-fledged self-consciousness, and you need language to be able to think or have inner speech, as he calls it. Um, so, for example, the right hemisphere could feel an emotional state, um, like something like sadness, but only the left hemisphere could identify it in a more sophisticated way, 
with labels like disappointed, discouraged, and bitter. But I don't think he defines self-consciousness right. I make a, a distinction between an, an awareness of the self as the subject and awareness of the self as an object. And I use this distinction to define self-consciousness. I say that one can be considered fully self-conscious if they meet one of these conditions. They don't need to meet both, just one or the other is sufficient. So the left hemisphere easily meets the I as subject condition because it has language abilities. So it can just state, I am aware. It's more difficult to prove that the right hemisphere is fully self-aware because it has no language ability so you can't ask it directly. But I argue that it does meet the I as object condition. This is because the right hemisphere can recognize itself. If you pre uh, present an image to the split brain patient of himself in the left visual field, he won't be able to say what he sees because the left hemisphere can't see it. But the right hemisphere can express emotions. So while he says he doesn't know what he's looking at, he expresses surprise and happiness and sometimes embarrassment. Then he's able to guess that he sees himself. I argue that this is enough evidence that the right hemisphere can recognize itself and that this makes it self-aware. So I say that language is not necessary for full self-consciousness because thinking and imagery is enough for full introspection. Mental images allow us to see ourselves acting and one can reflect on a mental image of the self in the past and compare that to the present image and from its stability determine a self-concept. I believe the best evidence that the right hemisphere is fully self-aware is outside of the realm of split-brain patients. There's another procedure called a hemispherectomy in which an entire hemisphere is removed from a patient. Although rare, there have been a few cases in which the dominant speaking left hemisphere is removed. Um, and if you were to consider the right hemisphere as having a primitive form of self-consciousness, then this procedure would reduce one's personhood. The patients do lose most of their language skills, except for a few words, but no one would consider the patients as less than fully self-aware. Like, they can carry out most of their day-to-day -day functions and express all the appropriate emotions. And so for this reason, I defend my position that the left and right hemispheres are both fully self-conscious uh, self in split-brain patients.